Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about some really exciting discoveries coming from a typical global cluster. Actually, we're talking about a very specific global cluster, but just global clusters in general. And the discovery is something that the scientists really didn't expect to find. First though, what are global clusters? Now, if you've done any kind of astronomy in your lifetime, you probably know that there are certain objects in the night skies that are extremely bright. And you can kind of see some of them right here in this simulation. Look at several of these objects that sort of resemble stars. However, none of these are stars. If I were to jump to one of them, you would quickly discover that what this represents is actually a collection of stars. Now, okay, this is kind of bright. Let's dim it a little bit. So this right here is what we refer to as a globular cluster, sometimes also known as just globular. Now, these clusters are pretty much everywhere, and they also have a lot of really interesting relationships and a lot of different correlations to a galaxy where we usually find them. We also use them for a lot of different discoveries, like for example, discovering the total mass of a galaxy, discovering the speed of different stars in a galaxy, or even looking for different signs of dark matter somewhere out there in the universe. They're also used for calculating distances to objects. Basically, they're very, very useful. But most importantly, they also seem to correlate to the history of the galaxy itself. More globular clusters usually means more collisions that happened in that particular galaxy. In the Milky Way galaxy, we know that there are probably around 150-ish globular clusters. Actually, some of the recent papers suggested that it was closer to 158, with maybe about 10 or so still missing. And that's how many we have here. If we were to look at the nearest larger galaxy, that of course being the Andromeda galaxy you see right there, it has roughly around 500 different globular clusters. And then if we look at the famous M87 galaxy with the famous picture of the black hole that was taken a few years ago, here we can find up to about 13,000 globular clusters. Which of course makes sense because these galaxies are way more massive and also possess a lot more stars and a lot more matter. But interestingly, generally, global clusters are also extremely old. They're much older than typical stars, they're also much older than so-called open clusters, and they can generally tell us more about the history of the galaxy, and even tell us about the age of the galaxy. We know, for example, that some of the older galaxies that existed in the Milky Way are basically the representatives of the earliest formation of stars in our galaxy. We're still not entirely sure how their formation differs from the other stars in the galaxy, but we know that they do correlate with a lot of other parts of the galaxy. For example, there are definite correlations between global clusters and the central bulge of the galaxy. There are also correlations of total mass of the galaxy and the number of global clusters. And the average age of global clusters usually represents the average age of the galaxy itself. And although to some extent they resemble certain dwarf elliptical galaxies and might even have several features that are very similar, their overall origin and evolution seems to be entirely different and possibly is one of the last mysteries that we have in terms of the formation of different objects in the universe. We basically have no idea how they really form. And though some of them might have actually been cores of different galaxies in the past, some of them have also been developed completely by themselves independently from everything else in the galaxy. And what all of this means is that these are individual objects, these are individual formations, and do actually form independently of things in the galaxy, which also means that they can be created in a completely remote location somewhere. But the question has always been, so what's inside of them though? We know that there are a lot of pulsars, for example, we know there are a lot of neutron stars. We also know there are a lot of stars and obviously maybe also a lot of planets. As you can probably imagine, the average density of stars here is extremely high. If you were to stand on the surface of a planet here and look into the night skies, you would probably see something like this. This is of course simulated, but this is the average density of stars in a typical global cluster. Now, this means that it's very bright, but it also means that there's a lot of radiation coming from everywhere. There are possibly also a lot more supernova, a lot more emissions from obviously black holes and neutron stars, and, well, if life exists here, it's probably extremely resilient or is hiding somewhere. But remember, the stars here are also much closer, so traveling between these stars is also a lot easier. Anyway, we're kind of getting off track here. The important thing is that global clusters are fascinating. And one of the recent studies that you can find in the description below decided to investigate the second closest global cluster to planet Earth. The cluster known as NGC 6397 located around 7800 light years away from planet Earth. And although it doesn't seem like it, there are actually 400,000 stars here. 
And because of its distance and also because of the amount of stars here, if you were to look at this in a night skies in a relatively dark place, you can actually easily see this without any telescope. And it's also one of the few global clusters in the Milky Way that has gone through something known as a core collapse. Which is basically an event when all of the stars on the outskirts slowly move closer and closer to the center and eventually bundle up, creating a much thicker and a much more dense environment with all of the stars being really, really close together. Now, why this happens, we're not really sure, and also what's exactly in the middle or in the center is also very unclear, but that's exactly what the scientists wanted to find out in this paper. Because the assumption was based on the observations from some of the other clusters. The assumption was that deep in the center of all of these core collapse clusters, there's going to be a relatively large intermediate sized black hole. You might already know what this is, but essentially it's a black hole that's anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand masses of the sun. It's not as massive as a black hole in the middle of a typical galaxy, but it's massive enough to cause the core collapse and to also possibly have certain other effects on these stars. And so their goal was to see if there's actually some sort of a relatively massive, but not really super massive, black hole in the middle that could explain a lot of these observations and could maybe provide some other detail. And by the way, interestingly, this particular global cluster is essentially as old as our galaxy. It's about 13.4 billion years old, which also means that all of the stars here are also extremely old. And the total radius of this global cluster containing 400,000 stars is roughly around 34 light years, which also suggests that there are roughly around 1,000 more stars or even more than 1,000 stars in the same volume as you would find around us here in the solar system. Which once again means that the night skies here would be quite spectacular. And to get as much detail about the stars as possible, the scientists here as always use the beautiful Gaia telescope that in the last few years allowed us to create an extremely accurate map of nearby billions and billions of stars with exact motion, exact parameters and properties, and allowed the scientists to make a lot of really interesting discoveries already. And so by using the data from the Gaia telescope, the scientists analyzed the motions of the stars inside this particular global cluster. And, as always, their discovery was a little bit unexpected. They did not discover what they expected to find in regards to the intermediate black hole. The motion of stars here was exhibiting almost like a Brownian motion. It was sort of random in all directions. Whereas what they expected to find was something similar to this. A lot of stars in different kinds of orbits orbiting a somewhat massive central point, which would be the intermediate mass black hole. Yet nevertheless, there was a central mass in the middle of the cluster. There was a central point that was more massive than other points. But unlike their prediction, the mass was not a point. It was a very large collection across a larger volume. Extended to a few percent of the volume from the center of the cluster. And that to scientists implied only one thing. It implied a really large number of remnants of black holes, possibly neutron stars, possibly white dwarfs, but most importantly, a lot of smaller black holes. Black holes everywhere. Now currently the scientists are not sure how many and what the total mass is, but it seems that there are definitely a lot of them. And all of this is kind of pointing at the history of this particular cluster. As a lot of stars in this cluster age with time over billions and billions of years, most of them turn into remnants. They became white dwarfs, they became neutron stars, they became black holes. A lot of this stuff slowly circulated around and moved closer and closer and closer to the center. Eventually, the center became saturated with all these remnants. Now, right now, um, we don't really know what exactly is the main remnant there, but chances for those remnants to be black holes is really, really high. And here we're talking about a lot of black holes, possibly hundreds, maybe even thousands. The majority of the mass in the center is definitely these invisible black holes that are slowly circulating around one another. And this is actually a really important discovery because it could solve another major mystery we've had for the past five or six years. The mystery of gravitational waves. In the past few years, the scientists have been discovering a lot of gravitational waves. Way, way more than anyone ever theorized was possible. At some point, they were detected almost once a week. And this is sort of really difficult to explain. Some scientists suggested that all of this could be explained if these black holes were colliding very close to a central black hole in a typical galaxy where we do expect some black holes to exist. But this particular study actually might give a better explanation. The explanation that has been theorized by many different scientists. 
a lot of these miniature smaller black holes are colliding inside different globular clusters. These typical globular clusters, if they contain hundreds and thousands of smaller black holes, will have a very, very high chance to have a collision with frequencies that we're detecting here on planet Earth. In other words, a typical global cluster with hundreds and thousands of black holes in the middle will very likely experience way, way more collisions than any other region in a typical galaxy. Mostly because these black holes are already very close to each other, they're also relatively similar mass and have relatively similar other properties, and they're also orbiting around one another in somewhat hectic conditions. Something that might resemble this, although with much bigger numbers and also with a lot more, well, technically randomness. And here the collisions would definitely happen quite frequently. As a matter of fact, ever since I created the simulation, there were already at least three different collisions, and this is only after a few hours of running the simulation, which means that if you were to wait long enough, eventually all of them would probably collide with one another. But I guess the next question here is, are all global clusters going to have similar conditions in them? Do they all contain these hundreds and thousands of different remnants in the middle, or are they all different? Which means that maybe global clusters fall under different types. Maybe some of them do have intermediate mass black holes, and some of them only have smaller black holes. This is of course not something we can know now, but it's also something that the scientists are now going to try to answer in future studies. Nevertheless, all of these discoveries in regards to global clusters are definitely helping us answer a lot of different questions we've had about the universe in other parts. But studies like this definitely show us that it's really important to study global clusters because we're going to possibly answer a lot of mysteries of the universe by looking inside of these unusual objects. And that of course includes questions like extraterrestrial intelligence. You might already know that the famous Arecibo message that was sent back in 1974 was sent toward a global cluster known as M13 because back then scientists were pretty convinced that if we were to find any extraterrestrial intelligence, the highest chance would be in a global cluster such as this one. And that particular sentiment hasn't actually changed much. The chance for finding something exciting inside global clusters is still really, really high. But unfortunately for us, the closest one to us is still pretty far away several thousand light years away from us. So visiting one is sort of right now only in the realm of science fiction. Although one day maybe we'll discover something coming out of these clusters that might help us understand the universe even better. Maybe even travel the universe. But until we know more or until we learn something else about clusters in general, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Oh, and also check out the paper in the description as well. Well, that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you for watching, I'll see you tomorrow, stay wonderful, and as always, bye-bye.